How's everybody doing today? Come on, give it up for Jesus one more time. I'm mean, just so grateful for every single story. Every baptism represents a life, which represents a story that God is writing in their heart. So one of my favorite things is preaching in front of this baptismal tank. And I pray we never get tired of seeing it filled with people. I also pray none of us ever fall into it on a baptism Sunday. So, man, but just good stuff. So grateful for what God is doing in the hearts and lives of people. And uh, it is worth celebrating. We've had so many big things, good things happen over this last week. And the Lord is doing a great work in our church and even through our church in our community. And uh, it's just been one of those weeks where I've been proud to be a part of Christian Faith Center. And uh, I want you to grab your Bibles today. Turn with me to John 12, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Split your Bible to the middle, make a hard right. And uh, bank right till you hit John. And if you're just not going to do it, we'll put it on the screens for you too. But you'll be a better Christian if you find it yourself. All right. Um, we want you to know where these things are, how to use your Bible. All right. Um, but man, we started a new series called The House of the Lord. And uh, it was so impactful last week as I talked about a heart for our city, a heart for our city. And uh, just being a church that makes an impact um, what God does in here should impact out there. And it's one of the reasons I'm so proud of yesterday as our team uh, uh, oversaw Love Idaho, just to see thousands of people being impacted that do not come to our church. That says something about a church. Yeah. Um, listen, I, I'm, I'm never a person that wants to be critical, but a lot of churches are about who's in the walls, right? And that's, that's not a bad thing. We should take care of those that belong to this place. But we must also realize the mission of the church actually centers more around who's not here yet than who is here now. And so we've got to have a heart for our city. Matter of fact, if you would help me welcome our online family right now with a big hand clap, that would be amazing. I was having dinner with Amanda last night and uh, ran into a family from Caldwell, Idaho. And they said, hey, hey, we recognize your wife and we recognize your voice and we watch online every single week. And so you know who you are, uh, Thai food people. And uh, if you're watching right now, just know that was so fun. Um, John chapter 12, I've given you all the time I can. We're gonna read verses one through three. And uh, we talked about a heart for our cities last Sunday. Today, um, I wanna speak a message to you that if I had to give it a title, I would call it Three Hearts one house, three hearts, one house. And I wanna read the story of a, uh, a dinner meeting that happens here. And there are three hearts represented in this one house. And I believe that each of us identify with these people. And I believe God has a word for each and every one of us from his word today. So let's read together John 12, starting in verse one. The Bible says six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. Now, I don't want you to skip over that. Not, not like woke up from a nap, yeah. but like dead, dead. Lazarus was way dead, like all the way dead. <laughs> like was dead for four days, like, like the mummy from Goosebumps books when you were a kid, like, yeah, yeah. like all the way dead, they had to unwrap him afterwards, okay? So we can skip over stuff sometimes like it's not a big deal. This was a big deal, okay? They're in the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. And a dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12 ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair and the house was filled and the house was filled with the fragrance. Let's pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts for his word. Father, we thank you right now that you've given us your word and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here to make it come alive to each and every one of us. I pray that we wouldn't just hear a message that goes in one ear and out the other, but the Lord, we'd have a word that goes into the depths of our heart, that brings transformation, that speaks to us, builds us up, instruct us. We even invite you to convict us, God, if there's something that needs to change in us. Come and have your way in our hearts through your word today, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, everybody said, amen. Amen. I want to look at some important things that speak to who we are as individuals and even who we are 
as a church. In this story, we see Jesus and then we see three different hearts present in this one dinner meeting. There are three hearts. There, there, in this story, three hearts, they're all fully represented in one house. Okay, three themes, three expressions of faith, three stations of the journey that we are all in with Jesus, three hearts, one house. And I wanna pull these out today and help us to see all three of them. But more than that, I pray that we would all have a growing appreciation for all three of them. And even more than that, I pray that we'd be able to identify our own lives with these three hearts that are seen in the house of God. Number one, I want you to write this down. The first heart is the heart of Lazarus. It's the heart of Lazarus. Now listen, it says six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. Now I don't wanna like beat a dead horse, no pun intended, but like, like way dead. Okay, even in the Hebrew culture, there was something about the third day. Like they would hold on, they would mourn the dead, they prayed, they did different things. In that culture, there was something about the third day. That's why Jesus being dead for three days was so significant. There was something about that. After that time, it was over. Hope was lost. So when Lazarus was resurrected, this wasn't like he coded on the way to the hospital. Okay, it wasn't like, yeah, I was dead for 30 seconds and I saw the Lord and I came back and, and it, like, no, he was like all the way dead. Like they had the funeral, the pe they buried the boy. When, when Jesus said, roll away the stone and about to raise Lazarus, they're like, hey, j Dog, like he stinks now. <laughs> like we get it, like you're, 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 you're you know, you're the, you're the power guy. Like we, we actually, we saw you mess up a funeral one time and like raise the boy, but like they hadn't even buried him yet. Like mama was crying and you were at the, like I get that, but Lazarus is so dead. Yeah. <laughs> and Jesus raises him back to life. The resurrection of Lazarus was, is arguably one of the most famous miracles of Jesus in all of the Bible. Like I can appreciate leprosy being healed. I can even appreciate the lame hand growing back. I can appreciate all, but for a guy to be dead to the point he stinks, wrapped up in grave clothes, and they crack that stone open, and Jesus says, Lazarus, get up. And he goes, boom, and sits up in the tomb and comes out. And the Bible says they had to unwrap the boy. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is a crazy miracle. So I don't want us to take for granted what's happening because they're having dinner and Mary and Martha, they're not just friends of Lazarus. These are his older sisters. And they're having dinner all together and Laz is sitting at the table with them eating dinner. When he should have been dead, he was alive. When he should have been gone, he was there. This was no ordinary dinner. They are serving Jesus out of honor that he is the God that raises the dead to life. Lazarus is a great miracle. Lazarus represents a profound lesson in our faith, in divine timing, and in the promise of eternal Life. He is the embodiment of the power of God to raise the dead to life. Now listen, we gotta understand, resurrection power isn't just what Jesus did once. Resurrection power is what Jesus does, period. Jesus is still in the business of raising dead things to life. He didn't just do it once, he did it many times, and he didn't stop doing it, he's still doing it today. How many understand that Jesus has not lost his power? Jesus has not left the mission. Jesus is still in the business of making dead things live. Christianity is not about making people better. It's not about making bad people good. Christianity is about people that are spiritually dead in their sins, lost in darkness and dominated by evil in this world. And Jesus Christ makes us alive in our spirit, alive to God, alive to eternal life. He makes the dead live. How many would shout amen? amen. Ephesians 2, four through six tells us this. It says, but God is so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much. Why does he make the dead live? Because he loves us so much. Don't ever forget that. How many are grateful he's a love motivated God? Because he loved us so much 
that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raises, listen, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That is your reality. You are not what you feel like. You are not what the world says you are. You are not even what your mama or your daddy said you are. You are who the word of God says you are. And if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you've put your trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, my friend, according to the word of God, which is pretty good authority, you are not dead, you are alive. You are not down, you are up. You are not seated as a loser, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's raised you to life. He's the God that makes all dead things live. See, the greatest, I I wanna get this in our hearts because listen, we are a church that didn't just happen to step into a place of revival. We have been in revival for many, many years. And we can say, well, you know, a church isn't revived until there's goosebumps or you can really feel the presence in this or that or until God manifests miracles in different ways. Listen, all those can be expressions of revival. But if those, if good worship services, if miracles happening in the congregation, if the spirit of God moving upon the lives of people, if those things don't translate into people being dead in their sin, coming to life in Jesus Christ, then it wasn't real revival. Because revival's not just goosebumps and good music. It's spiritually dead people revived in their faith and their mind and their hearts and coming alive to God. This is revival. The greatest miracle under heaven. Listen, I love, I love when God sets people that are addicted free. I love when people that are anxious find peace. I I love when people that are sick get healed. I love when all these things happen. I I love that. But the greatest miracle under heaven is still when the person that is spiritually dead is regenerated and becomes spiritually alive. That is the greatest miracle. That is when your story gets rewritten. That is when the spirit of the living God comes to live in your heart. The greatest miracle under heaven is still the miracle of salvation. Jesus taking someone who is dead in their sin and raising them into abundant life. And listen, Lazarus represents those that are dead coming alive. Every church, every house should be filled with Lazaruses. Should be filled with Lazaruses. As a matter of fact, this entire celebration we're reading about, the dinner, the pouring out of oil, the serving of Jesus and his team was all in response to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Churches should celebrate when people are born again and raised into new life in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, we join the angels of heaven when we celebrate those that are dead in sin coming alive in Christ. Luke chapter 15 verse 10 says, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents of their sin and turns to God. I want you to realize this is the Bible. There is joy. There is something that breaks out in heaven. There's a celebration that erupts when even one sinner repents and turns to God and he takes away their sin and he raises them to spiritual life. There is a party that happens in heaven. Joy that erupts among the angels and they go, look what the spirit of God has done. They took that man who was dead, that woman who was dead in her sin and he raised them to life because of what Jesus has done for us. Do you know so far this year at Christian Faith Center, we have seen 1,357 public decisions for Jesus Christ in the ministries, locations, and extensions of our church. How many are grateful that we are a church that keeps heaven celebrating? Day in, day out, week in, week out, we are causing joy to fill the hallways of heaven because the Spirit of God is working in and through us to see people that were dead in their sin raised to life in Jesus Christ. This is why we should celebrate baptisms. Baptism isn't just people that said, hey, I like this church and I think I wanna get wet in a Sunday service. 
No, baptism is people saying, Jesus has changed my life. He has saved my soul. He has forgiven my sin. I am not the same because of what Jesus has done in me. And I'm going to identify in the waters of baptism with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because I am alive because of him. That's what baptism is. It is us identifying that Je it doesn't make you saved. It doesn't make you alive, but it is identifying with the reality that we have been made alive by the resurrected Jesus Christ. He is not a figment of our imagination. He is not a theory. He is not some kind of rhetoric. He is the living, alive, breathing, ruling, reigning God that is still in the business of raising Lazaruses to life. And we should be celebrating the Lazaruses in the house of God. And we do and we will. And I am so grateful if you are a Lazarus here today, which if we were honest, that's every person that has become a Christian. But I think sometimes if it's fresh, if it's fresh, we celebrate you. People that are literally being raised to life. The second heart, I want you to write this down that we see in this house and that we should see in our house is the heart of Mary. The heart of Mary. Mary was the middle sister. Most scholars would believe that the order was Martha, Mary, and Lazarus for several reasons. Martha is identified as the primary owner of the house. Mary, as we will see, has a great heart for God, but she's kind of a freeloader. And Lazarus, tell me you are the younger brother without telling me you're the younger brother. Lazarus is never mentioned saying a single word in all of the Bible and may have been the best friend of Jesus outside of his disciples. Tell me you're the youngest without telling me you're the youngest. I got sisters who talk for me. All right. It's that's just. Yeah, yeah. Come on. So I, I want you to see that, that the heart of Mary is wonderful. It's extravagant. And we see the setting in which she, she cracks open this alabaster jar and pours out this, this what we would call uh, the essence of nard. But the reality is we don't exactly know what type of oil it was. We know it was an alabaster jar, but we, and we know that there was some kind of nard used in the process, but we don't really know what kind of oil Mary poured out of the feet of Jesus. According to one scholar, there are four different thoughts as to what the word used for the oil in this passage could actually mean. And I believe that the reason the scripture is not clear on, on the exact makeup of the oil is because it's really not about the oil that was poured out. It's about the heart and the spirit behind the person that poured out the oil on the feet of Jesus. The heart of Mary speaks to a heart of extravagance. It speaks to a, a heart of abandon. It speaks to a heart of generosity. And I wanna talk about these for just a second because the heart of Mary speaks to the heart of extravagant worship. Worship at its bare bones, at its essence, is really just giving your attention to God. Whatever gets your attention gets your worship. Whatever gets your focus gets your worship. And worship could be pronounced worth-ship. It's to give to something or someone what they are worthy of. We worship Jesus because he's worthy of our worship. And Mary is never seen holding back from Jesus what she felt like he deserved. And I just wanna, I wanna pause real quick and say, you worship something at the level of its worth to you. You always worship something at the level of its worth to you. This is why we have to be careful when we're in a great assembly of people like the one we're in right now. And we can look around and we can see people crying in worship. We can see people lifting up their hands. We can see people, maybe they give you a little dance. I, I don't know, maybe, they're, they're, maybe they're, they're singing so loud that you can hear them from across the room. We've gotta be very careful that we don't put some kind of a judgment on someone else's worship because they're giving God what they think he's worthy of. You don't know what God has done for them. You don't know the hell he's brought them out of. You don't know the place he met them in. You don't know the transformation. You know who they are now, but you don't know where they were when God brought them. So we gotta, well, I think she's a little too exuberant. You don't know what God has done for her. So you gotta be real careful when you're like, well, I think you're a little too much. No one says that about you when you're cheering for your football team. But by God, somebody gets on fire for Jesus and it's like, well, I'm not one of those Christians. Well, maybe you should be. Maybe God needs to open up your eyes because he's way better than the Niners. And he's way better than the Raiders. And you worship something at its level. All right, I'm gonna be nice from now on, I promise. See, Marys are a breath of fresh air in a church. 
Marys are gold to a pastor too. I look for Marys. See, what I love about Mary is Mary isn't just somebody who was extravagant in her worship. Mary was someone who was attentive in her learning. The other time we see Mary, she's seated at the, she's seated at the feet of Jesus and, and she's a part of the, the learning and the small group that's happening. Jesus is preaching and teaching the things of the kingdom of God and women were really not allowed into that setting in the biblical context. It wasn't right for the women to be in the room with the men while a rabbi was teaching and yet here's Mary, front row, don't really care what the social norms are right now. I'm gonna be seated right here, front row, leaning in because I need to hear what Jesus is teaching. And so sometimes we talk about Mary and it's like, well, I just wanna be a Mary. Well, a Mary isn't just that, a Mary is this. Yeah. A Mary is someone who's leaning into the word of God, wants to hear what God has to say, wants to hear what his word and his way is speaking into her life. I love Marys, I look for Marys. I look for Marys because they lean in. And this is something I've asked God to grow us in. I've asked God grow us in our heart for worship for years for years, I've prayed this prayer. God, give us as a church, at the soul of our church, give us a heart that, that, that beats like Mary, that doesn't just worship and, 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 and bring God what he's worthy of, but also leans into the word of God. Yeah. Healthy churches don't just worship God with extravagance. They honor his word with reverence. Yeah. They lean in and, and they, they wanna hear what God is saying and doing. And I've said, God, increase our passion. May we lift our voice. May we raise our hands. You know, as I've studied the whole Bible, I can't find a single time the Bible says, just worship the, the Lord in your heart. <laughs> well, this is how I worship. Well, that's not biblical worship. Well, this is how I do it. That's okay. Just know you do it different than the Bible tells you to do it. Well, come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. I told you I was going to be nice. I lied. But here's the thing, every time worship is mentioned, it's, it's a joyful noise. It's an exuberant shout. It's raising holy hands in worship. It's giving the Lord the worthy, the glory, the honor. It's giving him what he's due. Not one time in the Bible does it say, worship the Lord silently in your heart with a scowl on your face. And we look at Mary and we're like, well, Mary was just, you know, she was extravagant. Was she? Or did she just catch a revelation that Jesus was worthy of so much more than just, well, you know, I guess God's good. It's extravagant abandon. It's the heart of extravagant abandon. Now listen, Jewish women were not to let their hair down publicly. Mary did in order to wipe his feet. Jewish women did not typically sit at the feet of a teacher with men as a disciple, but Mary did. And by the way, Jesus did not correct them and side with the culture. He said, no, Mary has chosen the better thing and I'm not gonna take that from her. So sometimes people were willing to push through social constructs and man-made rules that keep us from what we really need to be who God's calling us to be in this season. And Mary said, I'm not violating any biblical order. I'm only violating a social construct. And Jesus actually defended her in that mentality and sided against the cultural construct. Woo. He said, no, Mary's chosen a good thing. It's all right. She can chill here with the boys. She's leaning in. So many, listen, what is it that you've let disqualify you from drawing near to Jesus? Mary pushed through all the things that the world said disqualified her from sitting at the feet of Jesus. See, so many people struggle to see past their past. Well, pastor, if you knew where I came from, if you knew what I've done, if you, if you knew the family that, that I walked out of, if you knew all the things that, I, I, you, you wouldn't think that I could worship God either. Can I tell you that there is nothing that you have done that keeps you from being able to worship Jesus? If you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you've been washed white as snow. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the perfect work of Jesus Christ applied onto your life. And according to my Bible, it says this, that we can enter into, into the very throne room of God, that we can come to the place where Jesus is. We can come before the Lord with boldness and find help when we need it most. We can worship with all we got. We can praise God, not because we're awesome, because he's awesome. Not because we've done everything right, but because Jesus has done a perfect work in me and you. And so sometimes you've got to reject the lies of the devil that say that you're not worthy to worship. You're not worthy to draw near to God. If Jesus has saved you, you are so worthy to draw near to the heart of God. And we see this, we see this in Mary. Mary was not afraid to draw near to Jesus. And we also see a heart of extravagant generosity. 
See, oils like this were often used as an investment. They were easy to carry, easy to transport, easy to sell, and they were highly valuable, especially an oil uh, that was in an alabaster jar. This, was a, this is a type of material that would be used to preserve a very precious oil. Now, for a middle daughter to possess something like this, most likely, most likely, we can't know for certain, but most likely this was her dowry. This was what she would use to offer to a suitor in pursuing a husband, a family for a dowry. It used to be the families would pay to marry their daughters and they would offer a dowry. This was probably her future. This was probably her dowry. And now here's Mary breaking it open and pouring it at the feet of Jesus. So this is not just some ordinary offering. She laid her future at the feet of Jesus. She, it, the Bible goes on to say it was probably worth a year's wages. And, and I just, you know, there's, there's no greater proof that God has moved your heart than when he moves your money. When, when, when what God is doing begins to move your finances, you know your heart has really come alive. And she laid it all down at the feet of Jesus. She laid it all down. Now, I love numbers grow, this and that. People getting saved. You know, one of my favorite numbers, we had 190 people so far this year that have taken the tithe challenge at Christian Faith Center. God's not just moving people's emotions. Come on, he's moving people's hearts. There's people getting a heart of Mary saying that the world isn't just worthy of my time, talent, and treasure. No, the kingdom of God is worthy of my time, talent, and treasure. I love the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon. He says this of this moment. He says, it was very costly, but it did not cost a penny too much now that it could be used upon Jesus. And there was a pound of it, but there was none too much for him. It was very sweet, but none too sweet for Jesus. I love the heart of Mary. The final heart I wanna land on and I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on this morning is the heart of Martha. The heart of Lazarus, the heart of Mary, the heart of Martha. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40. We're gonna read this together. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, um, there came to a certain village where a woman named Martha, well, now this, we're going back in time, by the way. A woman named Martha welcomed him into whose home? Her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing and she came to Jesus and she said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. This is probably one of the most famous scriptures regarding uh, these two women. But the reality is this, there's some things, I think we've been unfair to Martha. I think that we've looked at Martha's life Wrong, and I hope, to, I hope to unpack some things that will help us see how important and vital Martha's are, not just in this family, but in this local church as well. Because if we're, gonna get a, if we're gonna become a church that gets good at carrying the heart of Mary, then we also have to get good at carrying the heart of Martha. Amen. And again, I said we've been cruel to biblical figures over the years. I think Martha is one of those. Because the reality is, is it was Martha's home and Jesus came to be her guest. And by the way, Jesus didn't come alone. He had at least 12 disciples with him who all needed to have their, culturally, their feet washed to be made comfortable. If they had animals, to have their animals fed and stashed away, to have a meal prepared for them. Any respectable hostess in the ancient world would have extended all of these courtesies and more to the guests who came to their home, especially if they were of the stature of Jesus Christ. Martha was not ignoring Jesus. She was responsible for serving the house because it was her house. Mary was a guest. Martha was an owner. And churches that are run only by Marys, they end up in big trouble because they're really passionate, but nothing ever gets done. Jesus loved Mary and Martha equally. The life of Martha had an anthem and a passion to it, and she used that passion to serve. Martha's heart carried a passion for productivity. And if you read carefully, you'll see that Martha owned the house that hosted the work of Jesus. It was her place. It was her space. Mary just lived there. And see, every church needs Lazaruses. We need Marys, and we need Marthas. We need people that are willing to serve, to prepare, to take ownership of the house, the place, and the space. See, we have diminished the heart and the passion of Martha to our own detriment. 
The reality is before we even got here today, Martha's were already here making sure everything was ready. Before most of us got here, there were Martha's cleaning the building. There were Martha's unlocking the doors. There were Martha's filling the baptismal tank. There were Martha's setting out towels. There were Martha's preparing curriculum. There were Martha's getting food ready, getting coffee ready, getting ministry spaces ready so that people could come and have a Lazarus and a Mary experience in a home that Martha takes responsibility for. See, we, we have to have Martha's. You can't have a Lazarus experience without Martha's. You can't have a Mary experience without Martha's. The Martha's came here so that we could have a Lazarus and Mary experience. See, we cannot sit at his feet without a Martha volunteer team. We can't build a great church without a Martha staff. Can I tell you, I don't hire people to be on my staff that are only Mary's because they love to worship, but they don't get anything done. They love the presence, but they're not productive. They love to grow, but they can't pass that knowledge to others. And the Bible says that God gave the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, not to do all the work, but to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, that the church might be built up and effective and see the very purpose and plan of God come to pass in and through it. And so I, I, I can't bring on, now listen, do I want them to have a merry heart? Absolutely but I'm looking for Martha staff that have a merry heart. Right, I'm looking for people that love God, worship God, and have a heart for his presence and for all that he's done, but they're willing to get up, put on the mantle of Martha and go get stuff done for the glory of God. So we, we have to understand we, we need to be, we need those kind of people. Nobody that works at this church is not a Martha. You need to know we have some of the hardest working leaders, pastors, even volunteer coordinators and leaders I have ever even heard of. They work so hard to create amazing experiences so that this house can be a place. We cannot serve and disciple the Lazaruses that are coming to life without a Martha spirit and lifestyle. We can't create space for the merry encounters without people that have a Martha heart. And listen, our church has, has grown so much. I'm so excited about what God's doing and who people are bringing. But the reality is, is what keeps the church moving forward is the breath of God and people saying, I will become a Martha and take ownership in the house. Romans 12.1 says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way we worship him. Truly the way we worship him. See, true worship manifests itself in action. True worship expresses itself outwardly. Maybe we need to rethink what worship looks like in our life. See, Martha's life was a life of worship just as much as Mary's life was a life of worship. Jesus told Mary that anywhere the gospel is preached, Mary, what you've done for me here will be talked about. But guess what? Every time you talk about Mary, who's right there in the story with her? Martha. We're talking about Martha today, the same as we're talking about Mary. Martha's name is right there with Mary. See, listen, Lazarus's in a house give a sense of wonder and awe that God is still saving souls and adding to his church. Mary's, they go where Jesus was and they bring a fragrance and a grace from the overflow of their own lives. We need Mary's. We need people that are still attracted to Jesus, that still want to be where his presence is. But see, the Marthas actually created and prepared the space for Jesus to come and for people to have a moment, miracle, and memory with God. See, moments with God give way to miracles. Miracles form memories. Memories form a history with God. And our history with God is actually what pushes us into spiritual maturity. It's that we know God. He's worked in us. We know his word. We know what he's said. We know what he's done for us. But I want you to see that all of the things we talked about today actually came because of the faith of, Mary, of, the faith of Martha and in a place that Martha managed. This was a memory was made. A moment, miracle, and memory was made right here. And Jesus said, this memory will never fade away. Mary, what you've done here will never fade away. There's power in a moment and a memory. But I want you to see that Martha's heart and faith is actually what gave way to the whole thing. Here's what I want you to see. John 11, 17 through 27. 
we're gonna back up to when Lazarus was actually dead. So this was before the party, before the miracle, before we see Mary pouring out all the oil, excited that her brother was dead, but now he's alive. Listen to this. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been dead in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary on their loss. And when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet with him, but Mary stayed in the house. And Martha said to her, listen, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Now listen to this. Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Mary said, I've always believed this. Mary had an, or Martha had an established faith. Lazarus was brand new. Mary was maturing, but Martha, Martha had always believed. See, everything we talked about today, it came from the faith and the ministry of Martha. When Lazarus was dead, Mary was in the house in her feelings, crying, bitter, disillusioned. Martha's the one who came out to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. For I have always believed that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the one who came into the world from God. See, it was Martha's faith that brought about, see, right after this moment, Jesus begins to weep. And he says, take me to where they buried him and roll away the stone and raise his Lazarus from the dead. See, it was Martha's faith that moved Jesus, that raised Lazarus, that ultimately led to the celebration where now Mary isn't just bawling in the house. Now she's at the feet of Jesus, breaking open her alabaster jar, wiping his feet with her hair. And we give Lazarus the credit and we give Mary the credit and we forget about Martha who had believed the whole time whose faith actually set the whole thing in motion, whose house stewarded the whole thing, when the reality was it was always Martha the whole time. And as I was studying, I, I truly felt like even the three hearts of this house are a prototype. They're a, they're a pattern for our own walk with God. Matter of fact, our team late last night made this graphic. I want you to see this. Um, because the reality is we all begin as a Lazarus. We all come to Jesus dead in our sin, desperately needy of him to raise us to life. And if you really get a heart from God, you will become a Mary, where your heart begins to beat for him, where you recognize that he truly is the God of the miraculous, where you truly re you recognize that he is worthy of our worship and he does have something to teach us and we do need him to be transformed. But the reality is, is we should also, while maintaining a memory and a heart, we should never forget that we are a Lazarus. Come on. And we should never lose our heart as Mary. But can I also say that at some point, we've got to be willing to take a step of faith to say that I'm not just going to stay a Mary. I'm not just going to live in a house that I don't have ownership of. But I need to now step into a greater sense of ownership, take on a greater mantle and recognize there's an anointing to serve. See, Mary wasn't the only one with oil. Martha had oil too. Martha's oil fried some chicken. Come on, somebody. Martha's oil, Mar Martha's oil scrubbed some floors. Martha's oil cooked some food. Martha's oil opened the doors. Martha's oil created space for Laz and Mary to have their moment. But ultimately it happened under her watch, under her, her roof and through her faith and hands. And I, I just wanna encourage you today 
that you need to see where you are. Maybe you're a Lazarus. We're so glad you're here. You're a part of the house. And we celebrate you. And you give us great joy. And you're a testimony that our God is alive. Maybe you're a Mary. I celebrate that. And I hope you lean in and I hope you worship and I hope you grow in your appreciation and understanding of who God is. But if you're a Mary, let me tell you something. Martha's coming. The Lord needs you to carry a Mary heart, but a Martha mantle. Because, and I, I mean this with all my heart, it's so easy to be a part of a great house like this one. And we can believe that God doesn't need us. That they got everything taken care of. Can I tell you, no one can do what God's called you to do like you. At some point, we've got to take the mantle of a Martha and say, I'm going to be a part of what God is doing here. I'm not just going to be in the house. I'm going to be an owner of the house. I'm going to take ownership in this thing that God's doing. And I'm going to let my faith become a catalyst that other Lazaruses and other Marys can come and have their moment. But for me, I'm going to never forget that I'm a Lazarus. And I'm not going to lose my heart of Mary, but I refuse to live without the mantle of Martha. Because I don't want to just be in it. I want to have ownership of it. God's house is my house. And I love King David. He said this, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than not be a part of God's house. See, everything we talked about came from her. And I want to encourage you today. We're, we're never here to pressure you, but we do want to pastor you. And I want you to know that there's something that will never shift in your life until you say, I'm going to become a Martha. There's something that will never break until you say, I'm going to take ownership of God's house. I've had my moment as a Mary. I've poured out my oil. And you'll have other Mary moments. I'm not saying that goes away, but I am saying at some point we gotta say, I'm gonna be a Martha. And I'm gonna guard against the very thing Martha had to guard against. Martha was bitter that Mary was having her moment and Martha was doing all the work. But can I tell you, Mary needed that moment and Jesus was not willing to take it from her. And there are Marys, there are Lazaruses that God is raising up. And we need to be the type of church that'll say, I'll be the Marthas they need. I'll carry the mantle and I'll make sure they've got a place and a space by taking ownership in the house of the Lord. Listen, today, if that's you, we're gonna help you take your next step. You got, a, you got a card when you walked in. We're gonna have people holding all kinds of signs. You can scan a QR code. But listen, if that's you, we, we wanna make it easy for you to take ownership. But I wanna, I just, as your pastor for a moment, can I tell you there's just certain things that are not unlocked in your heart until you say, I'm not just a guest here, this is my house. God's house is my house. The house of the Lord is my house too. And I wanna contribute what God's given me to contribute so that there can be Lazaruses and Marys that God continues to raise up. I want you to stand to your feet all across the room with me. I wanna pray for you today. Online family, if you're watching right now, I wanna pray for you too. Our prayer team is gonna come forward as well. And I do pray that you would recognize that God's placed within you a gift. And that gift is meant to bless the house of the Lord. There's a place for you. There's a space for you to be involved, to bring what God's given you to build the house, to create a space for Jesus to come, for Lazaruses and Marys to rise up. And I pray many of us become Marthas today. But the reality is, is I know there's people here right now and you're not even a Lazarus. You're like, I get it, three hearts, whatever, cute sermon. Um, but I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. Like, I ain't scanning no QR, QR code. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. Can I tell you, though, that God loves you? And can I tell you that Lazarus is not just some Bible story. He was a real man that Jesus really did raise from the dead. And can I tell you that Jesus really still is raising people from death to life? He's really doing it. He's really saving. He really forgives. He really transforms. He's, he's alive. And he's still in the business of saving and resurrecting people's lives. And the gospel is not bad news. The gospel's good news. It's the message that although we failed, Jesus loved us anyway. And although we find ourselves in our worst, God gave his best through his son, Jesus. See, the gospel is about an exchange. It's about us giving God our worst and God giving us his best. It doesn't even seem right. That's why we call it the good news because it's God giving us his best. On July 24th of this year, marked 20 years since I first gave my life to Jesus. 20 years. May of this year, 
will mark 13 years of full-time preaching, teaching the gospel and spiritual leadership. But I haven't forgot my Lazarus moment. I haven't forgotten that when I was at my worst, God gave me his best. It wasn't about me or what I did. And it's not about you and what you can do for God. He begins the work in you through what Jesus did for you. And I wanna pray for you today because I believe there are many of you here and you're not where you need to be with God and you know it. And you know it. But I want you to know that God loves you, that Jesus died for you and his heart is to raise you from spiritual death to spiritual life. And you can experience it now. For the Bible says if you believe in your heart, that Jesus rose from the dead, confess with your mouth that he's Lord of your life. You'll be saved. You'll be raised to spiritual life. He wants to do it for you. So I'm gonna count to three. On the count of three, if you'd say, that's me, I just want you to raise your hand high and I'm gonna pray for you before we're done today. And I'm gonna believe God that he's gonna raise you from death to life. You're gonna experience a transformation. Are you ready? On the count of three, one, two, three. Raise your hands all over the room. High, high, high. High enough that God can see him. Come on. There's many, many hands raised. Many, many hands. There's a whole family here in the back. Woman all the way up in the back row. Many, can we just give these people a big hand? Listen, the Lord is speaking to you. Trust me, I'm not that good. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's the one that does the work. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal Jesus to each and every one of us. And it's as you believe in the finished work of Jesus that you are forgiven and saved. And I want to pray a prayer with you that's very important because you got to believe in your heart, then confess with your mouth. There's something about saying something out loud that activates faith. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. We're all going to pray it together, but I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, come on with faith, Lord Jesus, right now, I bring my whole life to you just the way I am, my good and my bad, my high and my low my success and my sin. I'm sorry, Lord, for everything I've done that separated me and you. I believe you, Jesus, that you died on a cross, that you rose from the dead, that you are alive today. Jesus, right now, give me a new heart. Give me a new start. Wash my sin away. Send your Holy Spirit to live in my heart by faith. Make me who you created me to be. Lead me in the way I should go. And help me to do everything you created me to do. I am now your son or daughter, saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.